So rather than uh, focus only on the honeybee, we see that colony collapse disorder, and I'm going to talk about uh, nosema and foul brood and varroa mites and all of these, all these maladies are all honeybee oriented. And as we watch through uh, what's happening with the honeybee, there's so many things going wrong. We're working against nature. And, and really, I'm going to say colony collapse disorder, they kind of haven't really figured it out. It's kind of a lower key piece now nowadays they, in the honeybee area, focus on the varroa mite, focus on a couple of different items. These are all symptoms to the root problem. And I believe the root problem is, as um, I'm going to call it earth true. Why are we working against uh, nature? First question. And let's look a little bit at, into it. So if you're staring at a honeybee hive, and I'm going to say a couple hundred years ago, the hive uh, splits and swarms and sends out scouts, and the bees relocate maybe about half a mile away. Next year, same thing. Both hives split, swarm, send out scouts. And they're not doing this, they're doing this, about half a, half a mile, maybe a kilometer. They're doing this. Why? The honeybee is an awesome pollen collector, and probably in that half mile range, it's best for foraging if the other hive is a long ways away, and probably also pest and disease control. Okay, so that's what the bee wants. But because it's not, and we'll talk a little later about it, it's not a great pollinator, we put them side by side by side by side. You look at orchards, you've got maybe a hive or two per acre, and Google Earth this. Now maybe you've pulled out maybe a mile, looking at a mile or two radius. You're actually going to see in that radius close to half a billion to a billion honeybees all doing this, all overlapping. And we're finding, this is recent research, that the diseases are being left in the flower. And so clean bees are picking up the diseases and head back to their hive. So I believe the symptoms are all of these Israel acute paralysis virus, deformed wing virus. The symptoms are we've got too many bees in one area. Pick whatever room you're in, whatever gymnasium, and you just crowd it full of people. And a few people walk in with the flu. I wouldn't want to be there for the weekend. It's the same thing that I believe is going on with our honeybees, is we're misusing an awesome honey-making insect. And the problem is too many bees in one place. So what we've found that when people are using um, Chemlon, True Green um, chemicals, uh, I don't necessarily think that the honeybees are failing that bad. When you put a, um, a hive, they spread into a mile or two radius, and so they're picking up chemicals from everywhere. And a little yard eh, probably isn't that big of a deal. But if you shift into the native bee arena, where the bees are very tight, they're maybe in a, in a two or 300 foot radius, what we've learned, um, I raise mason bees. I've got some people around the country raising these gentle little bees for me. And one year, you know, normally in a year, I'm going to give you a couple hundred cocoons. Every cocoon is a bee, so a couple hundred bees. And by the end of the season, maybe you have four or five hundred cocoons. It's really great. Okay, steadily. Get a couple hundred, get about four or five hundred back. Well, one year in New York and uh, around me in Washington State, um, boy, both places got maybe 10 or 15 bees. A couple hundred bees, 10 or 15 bees. The parallel answer in both these things is they put down true green in their lawns. And my only supposition at that point was that uh, the bees just didn't like the place. One more year later, we're now, a peer of mine is in uh, chariot orchards out in Washington State, and you had twin orchards, kind of a control and not, maybe about 20 minutes apart, so you had the same types of cherry trees, the same bees, the same mud they needed, same, same, same. This one did actually just fine. The bees pollinated well. But as you're coming back to about 10,000 bees per acre, so maybe 10 acres, 100,000 bees. Not one bee nested there. My friend gets back in his pickup and calls me up. Hey, Dave, you know, here's what, here's what happened. The farmer's really upset. He paid all this money, and all, there are no bees. He says, and to boot, I smell like chemicals. I said, well, what did the guy do? Did he spray? He goes, no, the guy said he didn't spray. I says, well, is there spraying going on right now? No. Well, go find out what happened. So we walked back out there. Farmer's still upset. And the farmer says, you told me I couldn't spray, so I didn't. And my 80 acres of cherries are surrounded by hundreds of acres of apples. Well, they're spraying all the time. Okay, so my supposition, there were no dead carcasses in the holes we had. 
the bees just gave the wing and off they went. And so I'm going to say with native bees, because they're not chained to a hive, the honeybees have to go, the bumblebees, have to go back and forth and, and fly through this toxic stew. So they're forced to. A native bee that goes into a hole doesn't have to do that, and, and they can uh, fly off. So chemicals aren't good. We know that. Um, but I'm going to say in a lot of cases, a lot of our research is maybe showing that um, while the bees aren't necessarily there, I think they're just flying off. Neonicotinoids, or neonics, um, is a classification of uh, a pesticide that um, some big companies out there have had around for a long time. There's a lot of, um, I'm going to call it mis-messaging. Uh, mis Ah, it's not quite conclusive. Ah, you really can't say these things. Um, that's harming bees and insects and stuff. And um, funny, you know, there's a real recent research that had I think 29 independent scientists going through about 800 um, independent peer-reviewed uh, reports, and looking at all of these reports, have come back and said, you know, probably the biggest issue are all the invertebrates in the ground. So your worms and your nematodes, those are getting probably the biggest damage. They're just, we're killing them off. Next, these are typically um, uh, systemic. So I've coated my seed with this neonic. It pulls the, uh, the neonic up into the plant. So now if anyone bites on a leaf, it dies. Well, if anyone gathers pollen from the same thing, what's the damage occurring there? And it's not that the bees are dying. We're seeing um, a real recent uh, research came out in England, I believe, that had um, honeybees next to this neonic passage, uh, um, neonic acreages, uh, bumblebees, and then mason bees. So the honeybees, yeah, they've got a huge radius. They probably did pick some up here, maybe didn't. Bumblebees, uh, the, the hive weight, they grow and they get heavier, if you weight them, went down. And mason bees um, did far, uh, far they, less numbers than the control site. I don't think the mason bees died. I think they just flew away. But still, you look at that. Um, no one really died. And they think what's happening is the, um, the honeybees are losing memory. They're, um, it, it's, there's, they're, they're disappearing. Okay. Um, is there a good answer for neonicotinoids? Uh, don't use them? Do we really need them? There's other evidence that's saying uh, we're being told to put this in our farmlands and you now look at the cost of the chemical that you're putting out there and the extra yield that you did or didn't get and they're realizing that eh, this might not be paying off. You're not actually getting the return that we've been told you'll get so why are you doing this? Europe is already saying I think no. The US is um, still in a quandary allowing this to occur. So for right now neonics, whether you're putting them in fields uh, they're trying to put them in um, uh, oyster beds out, out in Washington State. When you put them in the oyster beds, you're trying to kill the brine shrimp or the sand shrimp that are down there that prevents the oysters from sinking. When you're doing this damage, you're spraying chemicals into just live estuaries, like live fields. Why would you do this? So, um, and my little corollary after this, if you want to get, um, you want to hurt the people that are doing this, there's already new classification chemicals coming out. There's already new families coming out. Study those. Don't wait 10 to 15 years to ask about these chemicals. Why don't you start studying those now so after these companies have spent millions of dollars of research on this new classification, stop it before it gets out. So they waste a lot of money. If we can maybe do that, it's possible. We might be able to stop um, the use of these pesticides that are, uh, I don't think, that valuable. Now, if I did, now I, just, I just put a red spot on my forehead you know, from some laser rifle out there. Because I, I, <laughs> should I say that? I, I think that's a great to knock off Monsanto and Bayer and Syngenta and well, hit them in the pocketbook before they get out. Mm -hmm.